Today, I'm gonna to talk about Jordan Edwards. This is a world This is a world premiere. This is a world Hey y'all, welcome to another day here in, I'm in Brooklyn, still directing this play, Ready, Set, Go, Race, which was gonna be, it's gonna be opening in less than a week. Uh, we actually have our first preview for audiences on Wednesday, next Wednesday, and that'll be, oh my goodness, what day is that? <laughs> it's May 10th. And then the show is officially, is officially opening on May 11th, which is Thursday. Jack, what's going on? Jack, what's going on? Hey, Jack, what's going on? Jack likes to dig. He's in there digging. Good boy. Anyway, so, um, yeah, and I'm actually, uh, I'm still doing this fast, y'all, and I'm calling it a fast. I'm like, I'm stopping the denial. It's not a cleanse. It's, I'm fasting. I've been fasting. I've been fasting, actually, for quite some time, a very long time, um, probably uh, longer than, uh, certainly longer than I've ever done anything like this in the past, and, you know, that's it. And... Um, I've done increasingly longer fast um, since I started fasting going on eight years ago, going on eight years ago. And, you know, I generally call them cleanses, but I'm just, you know, that that's not really it. But what it, that's what it's what it is. It's a fast, right? It's fasting. And so, Jack, Jack, what's going on? Yeah, he likes to dig. So yeah, so today, um, but one thing that I've been doing recently is that I found that I get a lot of pleasure from having tea. It's just a way to kind of bring some variety and spice into my life in terms of what I'm consuming. And hey, come, come, come here. Um, yeah, so yeah, let's see. He may stop that. I don't know. If the sound, I hope the sound's not bothering anyone. So it's not bothering me, but I'm I'm worried that it's going to be bothering all of you. So this is what I'm having. It's this Puka brand peppermint and licorice. It says a sweet and delicious, refreshing, organic thrill. And what was it about this company? It says, um, sit back. There's a roller coaster of sweetness coming your way. Um, I think what I liked about the company is that they are fair trade, they're organic, and they have a bunch of other things, but you guys, I'm not wearing my reading glasses, so you'll have to tell me what it says there. And here, there's a shot at the back of the box. You can read what it says for yourselves. All right, anyway, so um, I went out yesterday and I splurged a little bit and I got myself a bunch of teas, actually. I got like five different teas and so I'm going to be sharing them with you. Three of them are this Puka brand and um, there's kind of a shelf that's the organic fair trade teas and I just went there and kind of went, you know, did a lot, did a lot over there. So um, yeah, and I actually have some other teas that I purchased the other day. So I think all in all I have maybe six new teas to share with you other than this one. Mm -hmm. I just started, um, I just started steeping this, you know, maybe just before we started shooting. It's probably got a ways to go. I was really excited about having it this morning. I love licorice and I'm getting a hint of it, but I was really hoping when I opened the package that I was just going to get hit with that really arrow, um, really aromatic. What is it? Anise? That spell, that, that, um, that, uh, that herb. Is that an herb? I don't know if that's an herb or a spice. I guess it's a spice but I really was hoping to get hit with that. And this, it has that taste. It has that taste, but right now it's really light. So I'm just gonna let that keep steeping for a while. <sighs> so today I, I thought I'd gotten, I noticed um, the, articles starting to pop up early in the week about Jordan Edwards. And honestly, I didn't, I didn't want to go down that road. I, I didn't know what I was going to say that would be different than any of the many conversations that 
have been had about this and I certainly I don't want to give the impression that I don't really listen and try to absorb what I hear from comments from people and I have to tell you I, I I may live in a bubble I may live in a bubble of of liberalism I may live in I may live in a world where I'm surrounded by people who think the way that I do and I, this is not this is not intentional I just live in Brooklyn it's an extremely diverse city uh, I deal with people from all walks of life every single day day of my life in Detroit. The same is true. Um, I'm surrounded by diversity. And so what I hear in the comments um, has been often surprising, very surprising to me. And I think that that's, <laughs> you know, uh, that's part of my coming from a world where people are just more sensitive to all of the possible experiences that might be happening in the room. And in that bubble, there are still things that get said that are offensive and there's still things that get done that are offensive and things that happen that are terrible, right? And still we get, you know, profiling and there's, you know, things happen. There's poverty. I don't live in a perfect world by any means, but um, I, I, don't hear some of the things that I that I read in the comment section in my daily life. And so I've really had to work to understand some of the perspectives of people, you know, who are commenting, who I'm, you know, coming to respect. But still, I've, I'm very, very challenged. I'm very, very challenged by some of the things that, um, that are said. And so, recently, uh, I've been talking a lot about social justice warriors and hearing from a lot of people that social justice warriors are why it is difficult to pass progressive policies. And in some ways, it's a way of saying, you know, it's their fault. And, and to me, if you're saying it's their fault, it's scapegoating, right? It's saying that we can't get good things, we can't have nice things because of this group of people that I don't agree with that I don't agree with. So instead of saying, I disagree with them, but I still have work to do, we blame this set of people that we call SJWs or that we call radicals from the, or call conservatives or whatever. How, however we want to blame others for the fact that we don't live in the world that we'd like to live in. And, you know, my response, um, you know, I think it was H.S. Ross who's, who's comments uh, very regularly, and I really appreciate you for the, the questions that you ask. And you ask some pretty difficult and complicated questions, but I, you know, my response recently was, well, you know, not to, you know, the, the person who asked the question, you know, specifically, but in general, when we're saying it's their fault that we can't progress, my, my, my question for, for those people who feel that way is like, what have you done? What have you done? How have you organized in your community to get people to, to raise awareness around the issues that are important to you? How many phone calls have you made? How many letters have you written? Who in your church or civic association have you engaged with to start, you know, really building a coalition of people who are working on this issue, you yourself, not waiting on someone else to deliver a solution for you, but how are you working with people directly in your community to create the changes that you want to see? Um, and in my experience, that is what works when, you know, we, you know, uh, most recently, uh, and I want to talk in terms of success, um, 
there was a lot of action and and engagement from communities around police community engagement, stop and frisk, stop question frisk. And after years of work, me, myself, all of the people that I knew, my, my friends in my community, going to the police precinct every month and sitting in those community meetings and wearing t-shirts that said, you know, I do not consent to the search, you know, really um, focused energy from all across the city, from, from organizations across the city, did we see a shift in that policy, or at least in the way that that policy is administered in, in New York City. And so I could, I could do nothing and I could blame radicals for the fact that we couldn't get a shift in that policy or I could do something about it myself. Now, I'm sure that there are some people who consider themselves either on the left or consider themselves progressive who hear that story and say, well, that wasn't the issue to be working on. There should have been something else that, that you were working on. So now it's you know my fault for working on stop, question, and frisk instead of, instead of working on you know uh, some other policy that other people find more important that might have been universally beneficial. Although I think the way the police behave affects all of us, but that's another, that's another story. And so I was really hesitant to talk about Jordan Edwards because I didn't want to go the typical route of a discussion about race. And it really, it's now that I'm, that I'm thinking about the way that I'd like to talk about it. Another thing that I was really concerned about was, you know, regardless of how you feel about what happened, a 15 year old was killed violently. And this individual had a family had a community around them that loved them dearly, that misses them, that is mourning them, that is confused about why this happened. I think, you know, I, it's important that, that some time is spent reflecting on that, that when these things happen, these people don't just become numbers. <sighs> that their humanity isn't lost in the tragedy and in the need to respond to the tragedy. And so I just want to share with you some details from the police report. Um, so apparently on April 29th, that was Saturday, at 11 p.m., uh, there was a 911 call about intoxicated uh, underage juveniles. Officers arrived and there was a party going on and they went inside to investigate. While they were inside, apparently they were searching for the owner of the, of the home. They heard gunshots uh, from outside. It caused a chaotic scene. They went outside to investigate the gunshots. They saw a car backing out of a driveway into the street. They shouted commands. It's not clear what was said. It doesn't indicate what was said. The vehicle begins to pull away and an officer shoots. They hit a passenger in the vehicle. The passenger was taken to the hospital and the passenger dies. And so, you know, there's so many questions that I have about that. Apparently later, no alcohol was found in the car. It was, you know, a around 11 p.m. curfew on a Saturday night in that county is 
midnight, so they weren't out after curfew. Uh, there was no signs that the individuals in the car had been drinking. There was absolutely no, the police, the report gives no indication what that, what, what was happening that would have made them suspect any wrongdoing from the people in the car. And the officer firing was, you know, went against protocol and it resulted in a young person being killed. And certainly we can look at it as an accident. But let's remove the identity of the individuals involved and just say that someone accidentally fired a gun at a group of people and killed one of them. And just, I want to just think about that. Someone fired a gun at a group of people. And I'm going to say accidentally. And killed one of them. What do we do with that? And before we get into a conversation about how often this happens, the excuses that are given when this happens, how the, the, the impact this has on the reputation of one group or other. And I've heard from so many of you uh, about Black Lives Matter, about SJWs, about how the behavior of a few validates the response from regressives. No wonder conservatives think about progressives the way they do. It's no wonder because we have these SJWs who say the things that they do, who behave in the ways that they behave and hold the ideas and opinions that they, that they hold. It justifies the thinking, the behavior, the actions of conservatives. But let's not flip that on its head because that's not logical thinking. And it becomes clear how that is not logical thinking when a handful of police officers participate in the murder of a 15 year old. The question here is, how does the state respond? How should the state respond? a state that condones violent actions for wrongdoing, a state that supports the mass, incarceration, the mass incarceration of citizens. This punitive, aggressive state 
how will it respond? In the case of this accidental killing of a 15 year old. That's it for this video. Like it if you like it, share, comment, subscribe. This is Reg signing off. Love yourself. Peace.